The Lord is here, let's pray. Lord, may your word be our rule. May your Holy Spirit be our teacher. And may your greater glory be our supreme concern. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. You know, the the passage that uh, Christine read out for us is is actually a very famous passage. You know, sometimes we think scripture is scripture, it doesn't matter what what piece you look at. Uh, But then people look at a list in the Old Testament and they think, how can that be maybe as important as, as something that Jesus said, for example? But all of scripture, the Bible says, is God-breathed and is useful. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, an an engineer will recognise the value of a nut or a bolt in an engine that is irrelevant to us. We don't, we just, we're looking at the outside of the vehicle. But to an engineer who knows the importance of the working parts, it's got great value. And it's the same with scripture. There are some parts that don't look like they're that important. And we're in danger of being dismissive. But to the true students of scripture, everything has value and everything has its place. You take something away and the whole thing starts to lose its integrity. But this morning's passage, the Beatitudes as they're called... Where the Lord Jesus says seven, eight, nine times, blessed are those, is one of the famous passages. It's one of the passages that many, many people hear regularly. And again, the danger with something that we hear regularly is that we can become too familiar with something, can't we? You know, sometimes don't our family members feel that we take them for granted more than anyone else? You know, you know, wouldn't your wife or your husband say, hang on a minute, you know, would you say that to somebody else? Or would you, in your manner, you know, and you suddenly have to remember yourself. Don't we do that? Sometimes we can be too familiar with something and not realise what it contains because we think we know what it means. We've, we can skim over because, oh yeah, I heard that one, I think we know. <clears throat> I'm, going to, <clears throat> I'm going to invite you this morning to... To really listen to, not to me necessarily, but to what the scripture is saying this morning. Because we're only focusing on the first one of the six, seven, eight, nine, depending on which, uh, you know, who you listen to, Beatitudes this morning, where Jesus says, blessed are those. He says it nine times. And we're focusing on the first one this morning, and it begins a series for us. This passage in chapter 5 begins what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus laid out what for many people was the manifesto of the new covenant. So you've got the old covenant with all its laws and rules, and then Jesus goes to the heart of what's behind it all and the meaning of it. And this first one, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it's been challenging for me, you know, in in preparing for today, because we'll come on to why. It's so simple in many ways. What, What does the Lord mean? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And one thing for sure is that the these you know, let's call them nine beatitudes, are characteristics, where he says, blessed are those, they're characteristics of the Christian character. And they are placed for us in Scripture in a specific order. Jesus starts with, (coughs) blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of heaven, and it's where we start our series today. We're starting where the Lord starts. And it's the only one of the Beatitudes that seems to include a negative as a good thing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And it seems to be a foundational characteristic because everything else is built on it. So the second one is blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are are the meek. 
Uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. But all of these build on this first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The great preacher Spurgeon described it because it was the first. As the first rung of a ladder which was accessible to anybody. Anyone who was desperate for God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You can reach that. You might not know everything about the Bible, but you can reach it. You, you might not know all the deep things of theology, but you can reach God. You can reach up and he'll meet with you. And in our culture today, we don't use the word poor to describe anything that's good, do we? Can we think of an example? And nobody aims to be poor at anything in our culture, surely. You know, if someone is poor at sport, it means they're, they're not very good at it. If a teacher told your parents that you were doing poorly at school, it would mean you're not doing very well. It would mean you're struggling. And if you bought a pair of shoes and they started letting in water after a few weeks, you might say that they were of poor quality. If your new blouse or your shirt started to fray after you'd worn it once or twice, you might say it was poorly made. And if Margaret, sorry Margaret to pick on you again, if Margaret left her handbag on the bus, you might say, poor Margaret. Yeah? We say that when we feel sorry for someone. When they've lost something or didn't get what they hoped for. Poor Stuart. He, he didn't get that job that he went for. He wanted it. And, and nobody aims to be financially poor either, do they? That's not what scripture says. It doesn't, it doesn't say aim to be poor. And what the scripture says is, I've never seen the children of the righteous begging bread, says the scripture. We are to work hard and have enough to be generous to others. So in whatever way that we use the word poor, it never seems to be positive. But here we have it in scripture. And it's a good thing. Here, it's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. It's having a knowledge of our spiritual poverty on our own. It's having a knowledge of our utter reliance on God. It's the opposite of being self-reliant before God. Where I can do with or without Him. It's knowing that we are empty so that God can fill us. It's knowing that we are hungry so and we cannot feed ourselves and we know it so that God can feed us. You know, you can be rich, you can be very wealthy, but poor in spirit, and that's a good thing. You can have a man who has everything in material terms, money, property, cars, standing. But a man who knows He's poor in spirit. It's a good thing. That man knows. He needs to rely on God every day for his spiritual life. He knows that everything he has counts for nothing. <coughs> that man or woman is blessed because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, a wealthy man or woman who is poor in spirit, as I said, it's a good thing, recognises their great need for God's life. The scriptures say that a man, a woman like that is blessed. And to qualify, it, it has nothing to do with whether you're rich or poor. Rich or poor, you're blessed if you're poor in spirit. You recognise your great need for God. And therefore, you have the capacity to receive from Him, 
Don't we want to have the capacity, the largest capacity possible, for the Lord to fill us? However, Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It becomes more difficult sometimes the more we have. The rich young ruler who approached Jesus went away sad because his great wealth was seated on the throne of his life. That, that's what occupied the throne of his life, his great wealth. The scripture says he went away sad. He needed his riches more. And Jesus, the scripture says Jesus looked at him and loved him. He loved him. But we all need to make our own choices. And the Lord Jesus let him make his choice. And he went away sad. Now a poor person who is poor in spirit relies on God. Because God is their portion. They're content with what little money or possessions they have. Because their life is not in the money or possessions. However, a poor person might be someone who grumbles and complains all the time. Someone who's jealous of what other people have. Someone who's dissatisfied, who is not content. Someone with a chip on their shoulder. A poor person like that is not poor in spirit. They're not looking to God. They're not relying on God. There's no hunger or thirst for God. They look around and they compare themselves with other people, but they don't look up. They might be resentful. They might even feel aggrieved. Why me? Such a person might be financially poor or rich. But they're not poor in spirit. But on the other hand, many people who are financially poor are poor in spirit too. And that's a good thing. And the Lord can meet with them. They ache for the Lord. They have difficult circumstances, but they also know their great need for God. They look to Him and... They know they can only be spiritually satisfied in him. Day by day, he's their daily bread. And no matter how little they have, those people, they're marked. They're marked with contentment. They're marked with the peace of God. They have the joy of the Lord. It's a mark on them. They have their troubles, but they find that the Lord is more than enough for them. The resting place We went to Edinburgh I forgot what the place was called it was a stately home and they had a Julie what's the Scottish name for it my love? They were the doves were a ducat if you've never heard of a ducat it's where doves used to be kept and they used to fly in and know where they, they slept so they could come in and out when they wanted to. This one had 620 little boxes inside. It was a building. And the wealthy used to have these ducots, or dovecoats as they're called, for doves. When they finished their day, they knew where they went to rest. They had their resting place. 620. And I went in there and there was like Holes where you could fit a pair of shoes in. From floor to ceiling. You know the resting place. For God's spiritual riches. Is the man. Or woman. Who is poor in spirit. There is room for God there. A person who is full. Of their own pride. In what they have. And what they think they have achieved by themselves. Cannot be poor in spirit. They find it difficult to recognize a need for God's life. Their life is full. 
but full of the wrong things. They're too self-sufficient. In their eyes, God's life might top them up, so to speak. But they believe that they have a good life without him. There isn't room for the riches of God's spiritual life with a man and woman like that. A man or woman who is full of their own ego does not have room for anyone else. They cannot give credit to God because they've already given full credit to themselves. And the word ego comes from the Greek word, which is in modern usage today, as many of you know I speak Greek fluently now, but this is the, the modern version, it's not changed. The word ego comes from the Greek word, ego. You know what that means? It means I. Ego, I. It's about me. That person cannot be poor in the spirit. And the kingdom of heaven does not belong to them. It's not theirs. So often we need to be broken first. And by God's grace he allows us to be broken first. You know sometimes we need to thank him for the tough times. Because he allows us to break so we can see afresh. So often we need to be broken first in order to recognise our great need. Somehow, that's when we get on our knees, so often. You know, a man who is drowning and cannot swim will fight to save himself by thrashing around in the water until he realises he cannot save himself. And it's often only when he's exhausted and his strength is gone, that a lifeguard can come in and save him when his body's limp and his strength is gone. You know, our pride, it stops us from being saved. On the other hand, a humble person, says the scriptures, will be exalted. The Lord will lift you up. A humble person is an example of someone who leaves room for God to come in. A truly humble person is first, first of all, a person who's poor in spirit. You know the Sumerian woman that Jesus spoke to at the well? The one who had five husbands. And was living with a man she wasn't married to. She was poor in spirit. She recognised her spiritual need. And she was able to receive from the Lord. What did she receive? Streams of living water. Jesus said, this water, you're going to be thirsty again when you drink it. If only you'd asked me, I would have given you streams of living water. When she received from the Lord, what did she do? She went back and told the whole town. The whole town came to know the Lord. There's things that only the Lord can give. Don't we want to increase our capacity to receive it? The woman who had suffered from 12 years of bleeding and being a social outcast in many ways because she was seen as unclean. It seems she had had money in the past because the scripture says she had spent so much on doctors who hadn't made her any better but only made her worse. She was poor in spirit. She reached out to touch Jesus' clothes. She recognised her need. And she received her healing from the Lord through her faith in him. Nicodemus, the respected, well-educated Pharisee, a teacher of the Jewish law, a member of the Sanhedrin, the religious court, the law court of the Jewish people, a man who was high up in social standing. He was by no means financially poor, but yet he was poor in spirit. He knew, even though his life seemed complete to other people, he would have been admired and perhaps even envied. It seems he recognised his spiritual need 
And he came to Jesus at night to understand what he was missing. Only the spiritual life of God can truly satisfy a man or a woman. You know, many years ago, I visited my brother. He was living in Italy at the time. And he speaks fluent Italian. Excuse me. <coughs> he speaks fluent Italian, which was a big help for me in communicating with the people there. And we went to a small village where many of the villagers opened up their homes to sell things that they'd made, homemade tea towels, uh, pottery items, things like that. Maybe things made of leather. And they were doing this to just earn a bit of money. From tourists and maybe people on holiday within Italy itself. And in one of these homes, a middle-aged woman served us and... She had a smile on her face. She didn't seem pushy. Her prices were fair. She was gracious. And she was appreciative of the tourists. And I sensed that she had a Christian faith. I asked my brother to translate for me and tell her. I said, Mario, can you tell this lady? I pray that the Lord will bless your business as you trust him. So as my brother spoke on my behalf, her face changed and her eyes filled with tears. She made the sign of the cross. And who knows what else was going on in her life? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. She recognised her need for God. And the things of God just touched her. And that's what the Lord wants of us. Not just once, but every day. The precious things of God should touch us. You know, if a king invited you to a specially cooked meal that they'd prepared for you with some wonderful food, you wouldn't have tasted anything like it. The finest ingredients, let's say five or six courses of this meal, would you, on your way, get yourself a couple of Greg sausage rolls and a, and a chocolate bar? Would you? Surely you would leave room for this special meal. You might even skip breakfast so that you had capacity in your stomach to, to enjoy it, to receive it. So that these fine ingredients could benefit you more. You know, when I was a teenager, my mother used to get so cross with me if I had a McDonald's burger on my way home for tea. Because she'd prepared some tea for me. And it was a wholesome tea. She'd spend time on it. Not just for me, I've got three brothers. And I would say, Mum, at least I was honest, I'd say, Mum, look, I still have room for your food. I can eat the burger and I can eat your food as well. Is it just me? I said I was hungry. It was just to keep me going until I got home. But we both knew, my mum and I both knew, that I had less room for her food if I had a burger inside me. That was the truth. She couldn't understand that I could possibly compare a burger with her wonderful home-cooked food. She couldn't understand that. And she was right. And the truth is that it was convenient for me. And I'd been, I had been tempted by the smell as I walked down the high street on my way home. And friends, brothers and sisters... The kingdom of heaven belongs to those who have chosen by God's grace to be filled with the spiritual food of God. 
which is Christ. To those who are poor in spirit, God will come and fill you. But how can God fill those who are already full of themselves? How can God fill those who are full of their own comforts, full of their own wisdom? We've been looking at that for the last few weeks. Who are distracted by their worldly toys. How? How can the Lord come? And unless a man or a woman realises they have a need, how can they receive? How many times do we fill ourselves with the things of this world and blunt our appetite for the spiritual things of God? Brothers and sisters, I ask you this morning, and I apply it to myself, let's check our appetites. The things of this world stay behind when we die. The food of this world passes through the system and out, doesn't it? But the things of God are our treasure in heaven. The spiritual food of the Lord is for eternity. But the kingdom of heaven, which the scripture says belongs to those who are, is theirs. It says the kingdom of God is theirs. Who's? Those who are poor in spirit. That kingdom of God has come. It's here now and it is coming in full measure. That's why we pray, isn't it? Your kingdom come. That your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, brothers and sisters, the, the poor in spirit are not valued by the world. Is it a surprise for me to say that to you? <coughs> the poor in spirit are not valued by the world. But they are precious in God's sight. The Lord Jesus did not come to save those who think that they're righteous. He came to save only those who recognise that they can only be saved by God's grace. He comes for those who are finished with trying to justify their sins. Finished with that, but instead just confess and receive his forgiveness. He comes for those who have laid aside their own wisdom and have received God's wisdom instead. Becoming fools in the eyes of the world. Becoming fools for Christ. That's who we are. It's not the wisdom of the world. Don't expect it to click with the world when you're at work, with members of your family, with some of your friends. He comes for those who want to buy the field because of the treasure they found in it. That's who he comes for. And being poor in spirit is the starting point, not just of our sermon series, it's the starting point for any believer's wonderful journey of the truly Christian life where the Lord comes. And he travels with his people. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth that we have to be recognising our spiritual poverty on our own. And without you, we're nothing. Father, the body goes from dust to dust. We're here today and gone tomorrow. We're nothing but a mist that appears for a while and then vanishes, as the scripture says. Oh, Father, help us to recognise our spiritual poverty so that we may have the capacity to receive and treasure the things of God. Thank you, Lord, that you've made that first rung of the ladder so easy within touching distance if we have a will. 
Lord, help us not to deceive ourselves by the things of the world. To not grasp for the things that are convenient, but the things that are of value instead. Lord, help us to realise that a spiritual appetite needs spiritual food. And the food of this world does not satisfy. Oh dear God, we thank you for your grace. That you've called us to be your own. And that we are precious in your sight. Father, I pray for your protection over the, the journey of each believer, Lord, in this church. Your protection, Lord. As they stay close to you. As they look to you for their food. As Jesus said, my flesh is real food. My blood is real wine. Is real drink. Lord, may we feed on spiritual food. Help us, Lord, even though it doesn't sound right in the words of the world. Help us to be poor in spirit. So that you can fill us afresh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.